Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Seeing as we are approaching the end of the year, the end of 2023, which is still insane, that means it is time to reflect on all of the amazing reading that I've done this year and obviously the best way to do that is to go through my top books of 2023 with you guys. So I have read around 180 books this year which is a little crazy to be honest. I don't know how I feel about that. And I think next year I kind of want to focus on reading less books to be honest because there are some books this year that were absolutely stunning and amazing. We are going to talk about those but like some books weren't. So I really do want to try and focus on quality over quantity next year. That is definitely a main goal. But before we can even think about the reading that I want to do in 2024, we need to talk by my top books of this year. So I'm going to be structuring this video just a little bit differently than how I have structured my top books of the year in years past, because normally I would have however many honorable mentions and those wouldn't really be in an order. And then my top books would also not be in order. But instead of that this year, I'm going to be choosing five, only five top favorite books and those are in order. So we'll start with like number five and move to number one. But before that, I decided to do three runner ups. So we're only talking about eight books. I just wanted to highlight my absolute top tier favorite books that I would literally recommend to anybody. These are like the cream of the crop. So we're just going to get into it. I'm going to start off by talking about my three runner ups and then we will get into my top books of the year. So the three runner-ups are not in any particular order because I kind of like these all like an even amount. So I didn't really worry about putting these in order. So the first one that we are going to talk about is The Final Empire by Brandon Sanderson. I read this book back in January. I finally got myself to start Mistborn and I loved this book so much. The thing with Mistborn is that I don't love the second or third books in the series. Like they're really good and I enjoyed them. But the other two books in the series just weren't as enjoyable as The Final Empire was for me. It was so much fun. <laughs> if you don't know, this series is set in a world where there is this magic system called Allomancy and there are different types of metals that magic users who are called Allomancers can ingest. And depending on what metal they can burn, they can do different things with it. So in this book, we are following our main character, Vin, who is currently living in the streets. She is part of the ska, which is kind of like the working class in this world, I believe. And at one point she meets our other main character, Kelsier, and she kind of learns that there is this uprising about to happen. Because in this world, there is this very corrupt class system because you have the ska who are the working class, but then you have the nobles and you also have this all powerful, mighty ruler guy. And obviously the idea is to take down this imbalance of power. And at some point in the book, obviously we learn that Vin is a magic user. And when she meets Kelsier, who is also a magic user, he kind of takes her under her wing to teach her how to use Allomancy and basically just use her as a weapon for his own cause. This book, it was so good. <laughs> it's so good. The magic system is one of my absolute favorite magic systems that I've ever read in a book. Obviously Brandon Sanderson has so many unique magic systems, but I feel like the scope of Allomancy is just so broad and the things that you can do with it and the new things that you learn as you go throughout the series, it's so fascinating. And I also really loved Vin and Kelsier as main characters. Their dynamic was so well fleshed out and I haven't really read a ton of books with like the mentor mentee kind of relationship dynamic that's not in like a romantic way. And I just thought it was written so well. Also at some point in the series, there was like a, a little sprinkling of a romance. And while it's not like, you know, it's not fantasy romance, I do also really enjoy the romance. If you guys have not checked out Mistborn, I highly recommend you do so. I feel like it's a really good place to start in the Cosmere if you're looking for a series to start. However, I do kind of feel that Warbreaker, which was so close to being on this list, would also be a really good place to start in the Cosmere if you want to stand alone. So I know a lot of people ask me like where to start with Brandon Sanderson. From my limited knowledge, that's what I would recommend. But Mistborn, obviously, it's a classic. So many people love it and for good reason. And just because I didn't absolutely love the second or third books doesn't mean that you won't love them. They're still so good. So just book number one. I'm so glad that I finally read Mistborn this year. And I'm so excited for all the other Brandon Sanderson books that I'm planning to read next year. Next up, we do have a bit of a romance. And this one honestly took me very by surprise because I have read some books by this author before. Some of them I liked more than others, but I wouldn't ever consider any of them to be like top favorite book of the year material, you know? But in July, I really wanted a romance book for the summer because even though this book specifically isn't summery, contemporary romance in my mind just screams summer because I read fantasy like every other time of year. So kind of switching things up and going to that more contemporary setting is very summery for me. And it was really what I was looking for at that point in time. And I had heard so many people talking about this book and I was like, I want a fun romance, please. So 
I decided to pick up Love Theoretically by Allie Hazelwood, and I am still shocked by how often I think of this book. It's just insane, honestly. <laughs> So this book follows our main character, Elsie, who is working for this dating service where men can pay the women who work for this service to be their dates to things, basically. So this opens up on our main character, Elsie, going on this date with this guy named Greg. They're going to this family function. He has his own reasons as to why he wants to have a fake girlfriend accompany him to this function. But while we are at this function, we meet his brother, Jack. So Jack and Elsie are introduced, she lies and tells him that she is a librarian, and then they kind of go on their ways. But our main character Elsie is actually, I think she's a theoretical physicist. Yeah, she's a theoretical physicist. And she is interviewing for this job one day, and it turns out that Jack is actually, I think like on the hiring committee or something. He is a part of her hiring process in some fashion. And obviously, when they see each other, he's like, what are you doing here? And she's like, what are you doing here? And it's just really funny. And their dynamic over the course of the book, oh, it is so good. It's so good. Elsie is very much a people pleaser. She was always putting the needs and desires and just interests of other people ahead of her own. But the reason I love their dynamic so much is Jack just calls her on her shit constantly. And he's really focused on doing what she wants to do and helping her to like articulate that to people just at all. And I just adored their romance so much. Also, Elsie really likes Twilight. And that is like, it's such a big part of this book, which I had no clue going into. But her roommate that she is living with is like a film connoisseur. She likes critically acclaimed movies. She only watches, you know, good movies. So like a huge part of this book is Elsie just trying to tell her roommate that her favorite movie is Twilight. And like, it sounds ridiculous. I know it sounds ridiculous, but like, I thought it was so funny. And this book is just so much better than all of Allie Hazelwood's other books. I feel like, I don't even know what she put into this book, but I was obsessed. I'm still obsessed. I go back and I read like parts of it even now. And I'm like, wow. And any romance book that has me in a chokehold like that obviously has to be a favorite. <laughs> also, as a woman in STEM myself, it is really nice to read romance books that focus on people in STEM. I think it's fun. It makes me regret my decisions less. It's always a good time. Then the last honorable mention that we have is a book that I never thought I would consider to be one of my top books of the year because I didn't think I really liked Dark Academia. But if you guys didn't see, I did do a video where I read Dark Academia for a week in September, I believe. And the results of that video, very, just, very good. And I did find a new favorite, and that is If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio. I adored this book. It was so good, and I cannot wait for a reread of this. So this book is mainly following a group of friends who goes to a liberal arts college and they are all studying to eventually be Shakespearean actors. So this book, it is drenched in Shakespeare references. They are reading Shakespeare constantly. They just quote Shakespeare out loud. And when I first heard that concept, I was like, how pretentious can you get? But to be honest, I found it didn't really end up bothering me and I actually really liked what that added to the story. But we'll get back to that because this book actually opens up 10 years in the future when one of the friends in that group is actually getting out of prison for the murder of one of the other friends. So this book is told in two separate timelines where one of the timelines is following Oliver as he is getting out of prison and he's kind of looking back on everything and talking to like the lead investigator of the case and finally kind of revealing what happened. And the other timeline is focused on the group of friends when they are in college and kind of the lead up to the event and then the fallout afterwards. And the way this book is told, is so different to anything that I've ever read before. Because obviously you have like normal conversations between the friends in this group that kind of reveal how they're feeling. But the main device that is used in this book to portray the emotions of our characters is through them performing Shakespeare. Because we are following them over the course of the school year as they perform a couple of different Shakespeare plays. And the way that Emma Rio is able to convey where these characters kind of stand with each other and how they're feeling about each other through them just performing Shakespeare is genius, honestly. Her writing some of the interactions this way, I feel like really just enhanced all of their emotions and it really made me feel what they were feeling. And that's just insane to be able to do that through like, reading about people performing a Shakespeare play. Like I'm not even watching it, I'm just reading it. And I just, I just get it. I get how they're feeling. So that was really cool. And it definitely made me want to kind of consume Shakespeare in some fashion because I know in the video, when I was reading this, I talked about how, oh, maybe I want to read some Shakespeare now. But a lot of people brought up the point that like Shakespeare's meant to be watched. And I'm like, how, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I really have an interest in going to watch some Shakespeare plays being performed. And maybe I could just like 
watch a performance online or something, I don't know. But it has definitely increased my interest in wanting to check out anything related to Shakespeare. And I definitely need to do that because honestly, I feel uncultured that I haven't anyway. So I think the Shakespeare references aren't going to be for everybody, but if you like them, then you're just going to love this book, honestly. And even as somebody who has never really read Shakespeare, I read Romeo and Juliet back in like ninth grade, I think. But that was literally it. And I still absolutely adored this book. The last thing I want to say about this book is that I absolutely loved the kind of mystery, thrillery kind of element to this. Because as I said earlier, one of the friends does end up dying throughout the course of this book, but you're not sure how it happened, and you're not sure who did it. So even after it happens, there's still this air of mystery, and you're kind of trying to put all these clues together and figure out what happened and why they did it and what their motivations were. And that was also so well done. So if you guys haven't picked up it for your villains, and it sounds like something you would enjoy, I highly recommend. Obviously, this is not a new recommendation. So many people love it for your villains, but I just want to let you guys know that I am now one of those people. So those are my three runners up. Absolutely love all of them so much, but it is time to get into the books that I love just a a little bit more. So we are going to talk about my top five books of the year. <laughs> so excited. So obviously we're going to start with number five and this one actually isn't technically a book because it is a series and it is actually a manga series. And I'm sure you guys know what it is because I have spent so much time <laughs> in my vlogs talking about this series this year. I have read 40 volumes of this manga series. I'm caught up, watched the anime, I don't know what to do with myself anymore because I'm out of new content, but obviously we're going to be talking about Yona of the Dawn. This series took me completely by surprise, to be honest. I had no clue that I was going to be quite this enamored by this series. Because back in March, I picked up volume one of the manga and I read it. I was like, this is, this is something for sure. <laughs> And then I could not find volume two. So I was like, all right, maybe I'll just watch the anime for a little bit and see what I think of that. I watched the anime in the span of like three days. I mean, there's not that many episodes, so it's not like crazy, but every free moment I got, I was watching Yona of the Dawn. I was absolutely obsessed. I fell in love with the characters. I love the romance in the series as well. And then I found out that the anime is only one season long, which honestly, jail for whoever made that decision. <laughs> but then obviously I decided I needed more because the anime only really covers like the first eight or nine volumes of the manga, but there were like 40 volumes out <laughs> of the manga. So I made it my mission in April, May, and June to read all 40 volumes of this one. I think it was like 38 at that point in time, but I read like all 40 volumes in the span of like three months because I could not be stopped. Like every night I would come back from class and be like, all right, it's time to read my volume of Yona of the Dawn for the day. Let's go. And it was so fun. So this series follows our main character, Yona, who is the princess of her kingdom. And in the first volume, literally the first volume of the entire series, something very harrowing happens and she has to flee her kingdom. But she also has this bodyguard whose name is Hawk, who ends up fleeing with her. And for the first little bit of the series, they're kind of on the run from these forces that are the reason as to why Yona had to leave the kingdom. But along the way, they end up meeting some friends. And let me tell you, the found family aspect to this series it is so good. Oh my god. All of the characters that they meet along the way kind of get their own introduction and you either get their backstory kind of when you first meet them or as the series progresses, you get to see more about their backstory in small snippets. And the dynamic that this kind of group of... I think there's like seven of them. The dynamic that they have is so funny. Like there are just so many moments in this series that make me laugh so much and it is so... I have no words. I have no words to talk about my love for Yona of the Dawn. This is obviously my favorite manga series. This is literally the only manga series that I have ever felt the need to collect. I literally have like 20 volumes right there because I couldn't be stopped. I just love Yona. And if you're looking for a fun kind of fantasy romance, adventure -y kind of story, I would highly recommend you pick it up. Honestly, as the series progresses, I like the volumes a little bit less, but my love for the characters and my investment in the romance really keeps me reading and it does make it worth it, even though there are some volumes that have not been my favorite. <laughs> but overall, I, I just love it so much. Moving on to number four is another kind of series that I'm going to be talking about, but I picked this book specifically because this is my absolute favorite of the series. And that series is the Veronica Speedwell series by Deanna Rayborn, and that book is none other than a dangerous collaboration. 
I I fell in love with this series earlier this year. It is currently an eight book series, but I think the ninth book is coming out in March of 2024. The next book is called A Grave Robbery, and I'm so excited about it. But this is kind of a historical mystery series with a little bit of a romance element thrown in there. It takes place in the Victorian period, which is one of my favorite time periods to read about. And the fact that there is a stunning romance in it as well, it's just so good. But this series follows our main character, Veronica Speedwell, who is a lepidopterist, which is a person that studies butterflies. So her main, like, job is, you know, hunting butterflies, natural history, that sort of thing. And I love any character that is, like, a natural historian, which you will see in the next book that I talk about as well. But throughout the course of the first book, she meets our other main character, Stoker, who is a stunning man, might I say. And I think he's... he does taxidermy, I think? It's been a minute since I've read a book in this series. I think I finished the eighth one back in like July, maybe. So it's been a while. And the dynamic between Veronica and Stoker is the most, it is so entertaining and it is so funny. They're both so witty and some of the remarks to each other are just so cutting. And the tension between them that builds as the series progresses is so well done. And I also do just love them as characters individually. Veronica is very much like a woman of the 19th century that does not care for the societal norms placed upon women. She's kind of just doing whatever she wants. She doesn't really care what people think about her and I admire her a lot for that. And Stoker, he's just so funny. <laughs> I love him so much. And also the way that he develops over the course of the series and the way he grows to care about Veronica so much is so... <laughs> I just, maybe I should have put this book higher because I love them so much. But I also think the mysteries are super fun as well. I feel like for the most part, I don't love reading mystery novels because I'm never really that invested in the mysteries. And I can't lie, there are some duds in this series, but like when there's a good mystery, it is so engaging. Especially this one is my favorite, obviously because this is what I'm talking about in this video. But this one, they go to this castle off the coast of the UK somewhere. I think. And they are investigating the disappearance of a woman who was supposed to be married to one of the people that lives in the castle. And there's kind of like a little, a little ghostly atmosphere to it. I also love the island that this one takes place on because it says, the island's atmosphere is full of shadows and danger looks around every corner. It's a very superstitious island, which I also thought was fun. All of the people there are always talking about like fairies and piskies and whatever that might live there. And just overall, like the culmination of like everything in this book, like the setting, the castle, the romance, the mystery, it all just added up to a book that I could not help but give five stars. I also do have some really good memories associated with this book because this is the book that I took on the plane with me and I was like reading a bunch when I went to go visit Cass back in March and that was so fun. So I just kind of like associate this book with that trip to Texas, which obviously like not a super valid reason as to why it's one of my favorite books, but it is something I wanted to mention. So if you guys are looking for a long mystery series with a little bit of a romance and you guys have not picked up the Veronica Speedwell series, I have no words for you, honestly, just do it. Then in number, oh, I was gonna take this sticker off, hang on. My God, why are there three stickers on the cover of this book? Who let Barnes & Noble do this? At least the stickers from Barnes & Noble are easy to take off. But coming in at number three, we have none other than Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. I read this book back in January, literally on a whim. I saw somebody talking about it on YouTube and I immediately went out to pick it up. I was like, well, clearly I need to read this book because it is a historical fantasy kind of situation where people are studying fairies and there's a little bit of a romance as well. It's not like a super main part of the plot, but it is there and I still love it. I wanna read this review because I hadn't read this before, but I love this. It says, forget dark academia. Give me instead this kind of winter sunshined, sharp tongued and footnoted academia full of field trips and grumpy romance and malevolent fairies. If that doesn't sum it up, I don't know what will. If you guys don't know what this book is about, this follows our main character, Emily Wilde, who is a Cambridge professor. And in this book, you are following her as she goes to Northern Europe, to this very small town, to kind of just study the fae that are there so that she can continue to compile information for her encyclopedia of fairies. And Emily is a very kind of socially awkward person. When she gets there, she doesn't really interact with the townspeople very much. She's very standoffish to them, so they're very standoffish to her. So it's not really going well. But much to Emily's annoyance, at some point, her kind of department rival shows up. He's a very charming guy. He's very eccentric, very flamboyant. So he's kind of charmed everybody in this town. And he's kind of just there to maybe help her write her encyclopedia fairies, or maybe he's there to take all the findings for himself. 
who knows? That's for you to figure out. But the dynamic between Wendell and Emily is so funny because it is very grumpy sunshine. And I feel like for the most part, that dynamic is done where the man is like the grumpy one and the woman is the sunshiny one. But it is flipped this time because Emily is like a very studious and serious person. Whereas Wendell just like is not at all. And obviously they clash a lot, but their banter is so funny. It's also very witty. If you can't tell, I love some good witty banter. And the general gist of this book is that this is like the notebook that she is keeping while she's there. So she's writing down her findings. She's talking about her interactions with Wendell and the town folk. I also really enjoyed the depiction of the Fae in the story. It felt very fairy tale esque and very true to what Fae are. But there's also this little, I, th he's, I think he's a fairy. His name is Poe and he bakes bread for Emily and it was the cutest, it was some of the cutest interactions I've ever read and they were just so lovely. I also really enjoyed the kind of scenery that was being described because Emily would go on a lot of nature walks in search of Faye, but it was just so peaceful. Just like depictions of her walking through this forest. There's like a stream trickling by. I felt like I was there walking through the woods and looking for little fairies to write about as well. I love this book so much. I know it is not for everybody. A lot of people have complaints about the writing style and the footnotes, which I totally understand. The writing can be very formal at times, but I feel like because it has that magical element, it never really felt like too dense or boring for me to enjoy it. And a lot of people also really do not like the footnotes, but I love the footnotes in this book because it makes everything seem so just academic and real. Because the footnotes would be referencing this other like piece of fairy research that somebody in this world has done. And it just made everything feel like it actually happened. And I just loved the light academia kind of vibe going on in this story. So highly recommend if you're looking for a historical fairy book because I do love a good historical fairy book. And now we can move into my top two favorite books of the year. And these honestly, they transcend the year, you know? Like these are just two of my favorite books of all time at this point. So obviously I'm so excited to talk about them. So coming in number two, we have none other than the Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. I read this book earlier this month and it it is... I don't even have words to talk about it to be honest. This is one of those books that I love so much that I just don't even properly know how to articulate my thoughts on, but I promise I will do my best. So to give you guys kind of an idea as to what this is about, I don't want to say too much because I think this is the kind of book that you need to go into not knowing much about it. You're kind of just, you know, along for the ride, seeing what happens because that's kind of what I did and I enjoyed it so much that way. Basically, all I knew going into this was that it follows our main character, Zachary, who discovers a book that seems a little bit out of place at his university library one day and he kind of looks into it, he reads a couple of the stories and he realizes that one of the stories in this book is a story from his childhood, like something that actually happened to him. And that is the catalyst for kind of the general plot of this book, which is following Zachary as he tries to figure out why this story from his childhood is written down in this book when nobody else witnessed it. Who could have possibly written this? It's very mysterious. It's very kind of ominous at points, but it's also very magical and very whimsical. This book is pure magic, to be honest. And the way that the story unfolds is so confusing and it is very like shrouded in mystery at times. But the more you read it, the more things make sense and the more connections that you make. And it was just a really fun reading experience because there were so many things that were revealed later in this book. And I was like, oh my God, that makes so much more sense now. And I would go back and read like those parts from earlier and everything would kind of just click into place and that happened a lot and it just felt like I was putting things together along with Zachary like we were on this ride together and we were gonna figure things out together and I love that obviously Erin Morgenstern's writing is absolutely just breathtaking to be honest like I have never encountered a writing style that is in any way similar to Erin Morgenstern's I also read The Night Circus this year as well that one was really close to being on my like top favorite books of the year but it's not quite there there are just so many lines that absolutely took my breath away that I just had to like reread over and over I was like I I'm so mad that I didn't write these lines <laughs> like imagine writing this book this just feels like a book that was made for me to be honest and I loved it with my whole heart it was so like just an unparalleled reading experience. I've never experienced anything like it. So highly recommend The Starless Sea. It is a little bit weird. And again, it's not for everybody, but it is definitely for me. And now we are moving on to my top book of the year. Honestly, I feel like The Starless Sea and this one are like slightly tied, but this one still kind of pulls ahead just a little bit. And that is obviously Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. 
I read this book back in June and I have been obsessed with it <laughs> ever since. Literally every time somebody asks me for a book recommendation, I am shoving this book down their throat. I'm like, read it. You gotta read it. This is book one of the Regency fairy tale series and it follows her main character, Dora, who when she was younger got half of her soul taken by a fairy or an elf. Was it a fairy or an elf? Not sure. But that basically means she doesn't feel emotions in the way that normal people do. She has no sense of fear or embarrassment, which obviously <laughs> makes all of her interactions in like polite London society very entertaining. But her and her cousin Vanessa end up going to London for the season so they can find husbands essentially. And while she is there, she runs into our other main character, Elias Wilder, who is the Lord Sorcier. Sorcerer? Sorcier. I still don't know how to pronounce it. It looks French, so like I feel like you would pronounce it in the French way, but I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, so I'm sorry. But they kind of get to talking. He is very interested by her and he wants to kind of look into what has happened to her. And kind of through that, they grow closer and the plot of the story kind of goes from there. This book I also just love with my whole heart. I feel like a large part of my enjoyment of this book really stems from the fact that this is very inspired by Howl's Moving Castle. Not really in the events that transpire, but Elias literally is just Howl from Howl's Moving castle and I could not love that concept more to be honest. I know a lot of people don't like it when things heavily pull from other pieces of media but because it is Howl's Moving Castle I'm going to let it slide because Howl's Moving Castle is one of my favorite movies of all time. I've read the book and I like the book but I didn't love the book as much as I love the movie but this kind of feels like adjacent to the book. This feels like a Howl's Moving Castle AU to be honest and I'm kind of living for it but the relationship between Elias and Dora is so it's just so delightful to be honest because they do have witty banter and like I love the witty banter but they do just start to care for each other so much over the course of the book and considering this book is like pretty short it's like 240 pages. The way that Olivia Atwater was able to like develop their romance I was, I was, I was shocked. I was like, I love it already. I don't even care if it's only been like 40 pages. I'm invested. But something else I also really enjoyed in this book was Dora's relationship with her cousin Vanessa. I thought it was so lovely because as I said, Dora doesn't really feel emotions in the same way that people do, but her love for Vanessa is still just so pure and lovely. And it kind of like transcends her inability to feel emotions. Like she feels something for Vanessa. And I think that's so delightful to be honest that they're so close. And I just love a good whimsical historical fairy book. It's just, it's like, it's just another book that like, I don't fully know how to articulate my thoughts on, but it is just so, it's so good. So if you love Howl's Moving Castle or if you love things that take place in the Regency period, preferably if you like both, you need to pick this book up. Because honestly, I was I was a changed woman after I read this book. Honestly, same thing with The Starless Sea. Like these books, I never really got it when people said this, but like, I think I get it now. These books really rewired my brain chemistry in like the least dramatic way possible. And I'm so glad that I was able to find two of my new favorite books of all time this year. Like the others are really good, but like these are the stars of the show and I love them so much. So at this point, I think I have said all I can say without just getting repetitive, to be honest. Also, I do want to say I am filming this video like a little bit before the end of the year, so I have not completely read all of the books that I'm going to read in December. And I do have a feeling that Heartstopper Volume 5 probably would have found its way onto this list had I filmed this video after I read that. So I'm putting that as like a, like a probably, maybe, honorable mention. But aside from that, here are my top favorite books of the year. I feel like 2023 was honestly a really good reading year. I found so many books that I absolutely adored. I've definitely found some new genres that I need to check out. Specifically, I need to look more into like historical romance and like historical fantasy. That's definitely one of my goals for 2024 is to read more historical fantasy because I really love it. And so many of the books that I adore are historical fantasy. So I'm like, how have I not been reading more of it, you know? But I've had such a fun time filming this video. Obviously, I love getting to sit down and talk about some of my favorite books. So I've had such a good time just recapping some of my highlights of the year. I hope you guys also had an amazing reading year. Obviously, I would love to hear what some of your top books of the year are down below. Maybe give me like your top three. Also, before we go, I did want to thank everybody over on my Patreon. I love you guys so much. If you guys are ever looking for more content from me, my Patreon is always linked down below. Actually, my top two books of the year were actually buddy reads that we did on Patreon. So if you guys want to see my spoiler-filled reading vlogs on these, you could go check those out if you are so inclined. I also did just want to thank all of you who are here and watching this video. Honestly, your support seriously does mean the absolute world to me. And 2023 has been an amazing year for this channel. And I just really wanted to let you guys know how grateful I am for you guys and for you allowing me to be able to do this. It is crazy. And I literally never thought that this could happen. So 
just thank you so, so much. So with that, I'm going to let you guys go. I hope you have been having an amazing December and an amazing holiday season, whether you've been celebrating something or just kind of hanging out and chilling. So I will see you guys in my next video.